I thought it was time to take a look inside one of these little lithium battery chargers and it's the type that, you know, you just fold the pins out, stuff it in the socket and stick any size of lithium cell in and the springy contact adjusts. And this has got the interesting uh, extra feature, it says Intelligence can be positive and negat, I've charge. Quick charge, safe and reliable. So um, that suggests it might have that polarity reversing thing in it and I have confirmed that by plugging it in Uh, putting a battery in it, one way around, and uh, measuring the current, and the current varies. If the battery is really discharged, it'll be quite a modest current, it'll be a good few hundred milli milliamps. As the battery gets closer to, say, uh, you know, it's not even that high a voltage. Hold on, let's see what it was. Let's measure the current first. I'm using this on the 10 amp range, or the 20 amp range in this case, so I don't load, uh, add too much resistance. So... Here's the negative. Uh, I'm going to break into the circuit here. Get this charging, if see if I can make a proper connection. There we go, and it's uh, showing about 40 milliamps it's dropped down to. It was at 300 milliamps earlier on. So let's see what voltage the cell's at for that. So I'll swap this back from the current range so I don't short out the cell. That would not be so great. And let's turn this to voltage. And the cell's measuring 3.8 volts, which isn't super mega high, so that means this is going to take quite a time to charge a cell. It makes me wonder if it's just got a, a simple resistive um, limiter. Uh, but it must have a fairly active circuit if it's got the polarity detection. I know that some of the little tiny chargers you get, uh, the, the springy, like actually this one here, you get chargers like this that go into a USB port it pops out and it also doubles as a card reader and you can spread the contacts in these and you just basically get a battery that will fit into either the contacts sit down from above or they push in from the end there's a little rubber pad that holds and you just align these up with the positive and negative contacts so it virtually charges any battery any lithium cell but uh, these things uh, apparently contain the automatic polarity detection and swap the polarity. So it might be something similar that's being used in this. So uh, let's open it and find out. Oop. Let's have it turning the meter to the off position. All I need to do is push the button. Right. One screw. Does this get hidden screws? Oh, it does. It says in this uh, output, 3.7 volt, 500 milliamps. End of charge voltage, 4.2 volts. Um, so the 500 milliamps is, must be with a completely flat cell. Now, is this thing going to spring apart? I should mention I did check the reverse polarity thing charging by sticking this little nut in here and actually putting the battery in the wrong way around. And it, it did. It did charge, seem to charge it properly in the opposite polarity. Right, so there's the contacts that go in, they just they just sit in there and they just swing up against these two contacts and that's what makes the connection and also makes these clicking out of way, the way when uh, they're, they're retracted. Oh, there's a spingy strip that's going to ping out suddenly. Some of these, the, especially if you get the multi-battery chargers, when you open them up, these springy... Uh, strips that make the contact. Basically speaking, the plunger here slides along that uh, fixed metal strip and, well, it's not fixed now because I've just un unlocked it. Yeah, and uh, you get them, the idea. And uh, basically speaking, it just, the, this strip here with the solder connection is supposed to stay still while the other slides along making connection, uh, no matter where it is in the actual, uh, the batteries and the charger. Right, I've made a mess of that. So here's the circuitry. So, there's a little switch mode transformer. Mains is coming in off these connections. Uh, one goes straight up to this capacitor here. The other goes through a diode to the capacitor. 
Right, I'm just going to pause and I'm going to reverse engineer this. Okay, so one quick burst of reverse engineering later, I, I did the usual. I took a photo of the back, flipped it over and faded it out so I could draw the components on as viewed from the front. It just makes things so much easier to trace them out. So having traced it out, the circuitry is very simple, there really isn't much at all. The switch mode power supply is based on a standard transistor. Uh, the transistor, I should write the number of tra the transistor in, is actually, all the component values are actually written in the circuit board. 13001. 13001, which is a fairly generic transistor. Its NPN is at a high voltage, about 400 to 600 volts. And when you power the circuit up, uh, there's a single diode, 1N4007, charges this capacitor, uh, the smoothing capacitor, one microfarad, not super generous, but I, I don't think this circuit works at a very high current. Um, the resistor here uh, kick starts. It's a, it's a high value resistor that trickles enough current that the transistor starts, charge, uh, starts conducting. And when it does, it induces a current in this, the primary here, which induces a um, it couples to the feedback here, which uh, then is coupled to, to the base of the transistor via this capacitor and this quite low value resistor at 30 ohms, so 1 nanofarad, 30 ohms. And as the current in, through this increases, it causes an avalanche effect that it drives the transistor on. Uh, when uh, no more uh, magnetic field can be coupled across, when the coil is not so much saturated, but when it's as much as that primary can put in it, it uh, the current coupled back stops and then it, it basically has that opposite effect, it turns off. This feedback circuit, there's what looks like a 1N4148 diode, basically pumps this, um, because the uh, this is the opposite polarity, that's positive when it's driving the transistor, but negative when the field's collapsing, and that's the point it will be putting the current through this diode into the secondary. But if that's offload, the, depending on the voltage in that capacitor, the voltage in this capacitor here will change as well and it will be charged negatively um, and when it's been charged to a high enough negative voltage then the current to the drive the gate has to exceed the voltage of this 7.8 volt zener. Now it did say on the circuit board it said 6.2 volt zener but I tested it and it didn't start conducting until about 7.8 volts but that's the regulation. It means that if this side's off load then the voltage in this capacitor rises to the point that it basically stops the, the circuit or, or reduces its running to a very low level until the load's put back on again. On the secondary, we've got a 1N4148 ungenerous diode, which I'd normally only rate for 100 milliamps max, and it's charging a 100 microfarad 16 volt capacitor. And then it's this dedicated chip, HT3582D, actually HT3582DM, but I ran out of space for the M, but not to worry. Um, and that has, that does everything basically. It's got the plus and minus in. It's got two LEDs that it drives directly. It's got internal resistors, one for fuel, one for charging. And then the two outputs are each decoupled to ground to the negative rail by a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And as far as I can see, this that this detects the voltage on the battery that's and won't obviously start charging a battery if it's gone too low, uh, if it's a lithium cell. So if it's dropped below about, I'd guess, 2.5 volts-ish or less, it won't try charging it. But it also uses the detection of the battery voltage to determine the polarity. As far as I can see, this is an H-bridge driver in it. Not a lot of information in the, that I could find immediately um, about that, other than the vague box outline. But it does appear that the polarity can be reversed depending on which way you connect the battery. And that does correlate to this thing that says um, intelligence can be positive and negative. I've charged. Quick charge, safe and reliable. That's that's quite a funny sticker, but um, yeah, it suggests that polarity could be swapped. But most cases, the uh, connection in here would be the positive because it's recessed slightly, and a lithium cell couldn't really make contact with that because it's recessed. But I think they've probably just used this chip because it's the cheapest and easiest way to do it because it's such a standard chip. So it's neat enough. The component that's going to go bang. Oh, I like the way this cable's been pinched. Melted actually. Uh, the component that's going to go bang, because uh, quite a few of you have said you got one of these chargers and it went bang, or not necessarily this exact charger, that component there is the one that goes bang. That's the transistor that's doing all the work here, and any sort of oddity in the output could ultimately result in this popping. But um, this is just a circuit that's been kept the absolute simplest possible. The separation isn't great at all. 
so um yeah it's not you know up to western standards shall we say but um it's just very typical of the type of design as always with these things i'd suggest put the battery in and then plug it in and when it's finished charging unplug it and then take the battery out don't go poking around metal contacts you just don't know uh, the day that you know there's going to be a solder bridge or you know the transformer's going to be miswound or whatever but um, yep yeah, it, it's an interesting enough little circuit quite neat right so then i thought so what's the difference going to be between say something like the wee single charger and this double one and the difference is that uh, it uses a slightly beefier transistor uh, although all the circuitry is the same the only difference is there's an extra capacitor with a value, quite a high value, um, an unusual value, brown, orange, orange. So that's 13k, and they've got that across this little electrolytic here, uh, just to probably just to keep it trickling down, just to sort of, well, make the circuit more responsive, shall we say, to the load. Um, it's uh, pretty much identical looking. Yep, there's the, out, the one improvement on the output. Instead of using the 1N4148, they have used a beefier 1-amp diode. The chip is the same chip, that, but the HT3582D, but without the M at the end, which is probably just the package form, but it's just a basic little chip. And I wondered if there'd be separation between the inputs, you know, each cell, if they'd be independent, but they're actually connected together in parallel. Uh, which means if you put in one fully charged cell, or you had one cell fully charged, and you put in a fully discharged cell, a lot of current is potentially going to flow along the tracks and the wires in here from one cell to the other. Um, but um, I guess ultimately that's what happens when you get cheapy units. They have made a modest attempt at isolation here. Most of the space is, uh, they keep about three millimetres here. Uh, until, oh wait, no, there's the mains coming in. Oh no, actually the isolation isn't that great at all, is it? Because it's defeated by these terminals down here. They've kind of made a, a, an effort to keep it separate, but then it, it drops to about a, a, just under a millimetre down here between that uh, connection, the sort of springy mains contact, and the low voltage side. So, um, yeah, it uh, uh, just seems to be the common topology, and I guess ultimately it wouldn't matter which way you put the batteries in this, except if you put one in one way, round and one in the other way round, that would cause major current flow. But other than that, it does seem to have the chip that would automatically reverse if a single cell was put in back to front. But yeah, interesting things.